In this video, we're going to talk a little bit more about the concept of optical depth. If you recall, optical depth was introduced in the context of the radiative transport equation, where we had that the change in specific intensity along a path is equal to the source emission minus the extinction, which depended upon the intensity at each point. So to help us understand this, we defined a tau sub nu which was the integral along a path of the extinction coefficient. And this was the optical depth. And even though we derived the optical depth in the limit of, a, of not having any emission in our radiative transport equation, in fact, we found that we could write the entire radiative transport equation in terms of optical depth, and it took a nice form. And I'll write the simplified form for a homogeneous medium here, where the source function sub nu, which was really just the ratio of the emission over the absorption coefficient, that it did not change with optical depth, so that we could write that the specific intensity changed with optical depth with a term that reflected the background that was attenuated exponentially with optical depth, plus the source function, that is the emission from some cloud, that asymptotically approaches unity as optical depth goes up. And we saw that there were two important limits of optical depth. There's when optical depth was much larger than one, which we called optically thick. And in this limit, we lose information about the background. It gets attenuated away, and our specific intensity that we observe asymptotes to the source function. And in the optically thin limit, where the optical depth is much less than one, then we retain information about the background and the source function only changes that linearly with optical depth. Now it turns out there are a few different ways that you can factor optical depth. And we're going to explore cases where the extinction coefficient a sub nu is constant. So suppose a sub nu is constant along a path. In this case, the optical depth is just given by the extinction coefficient multiplied by the distance that you've traveled. And as we've discussed previously, if s is a distance, then the extinction coefficient has units of inverse distance. Now another way that we could factor this is the number density, n, times a cross-section sigma sub nu times distance s. So n was a number density. So a number density is just counts which have no units. So it could be like numbers of particles, for example, per volume. And cross-section, of course, has units of area times distance. So here we've effectively expressed the extinction coefficient as the number of particles or dust grains in the way as a function of volume times the cross-sectional area of each of those particles. So the picture of what's going on here is that you have some volume with particles of some, with some cross-sectional area inside of it, some specific intensity, some radiation goes in one side of it, and it comes out the other side, but some of that emission has been blocked. In fact, if we, if we looked at it, if we looked in through this side of the box, what we'd see is that some region of our image on the sky will have been covered up by these particles. And so another way of discussing optical depth is what fraction of your image is covered up by these particles. In fact, we don't care exactly about the number density of those particles. We care about how many of them are there are integrated over this distance s. So in fact, we could introduce another concept here, the column density, which is the number density integrated over s. Of course, the column density has units of 1 over area, and it's saying effectively for some differential piece of cloud that you're looking through, what fraction of it is covered up. So introducing the concept of column density, we can now express our optical depth as simply our column density times the cross-sectional area of the particle. And these together really do measure the fractional area that is covered up as you look through this cloud towards this background in units of E. And just for completeness, there are other ways to factor 
the optical depth. For example, a common way is to factor optical depth as the product of a density, so this is now grams per unit volume, times an opacity, that's usually a kappa, kappa sub nu, integrated over a distance. There are lots of ways to factor optical depth, but some important ones are with number density times cross-sectional area times distance, which is essentially the column density times the cross-sectional area of your particle. And another way is the mass density, grams per volume, times the opacity, times the distance. Now just to complete here, I thought I'd give you a couple pictures of what optical depth looks like. So here's a plot of the Mona Lisa, where I've put enough particles in front of the Mona Lisa to achieve an optical depth of one-tenth, that's 0 0.1. But I've just changed the grain size, so you can see as if I have a very small grain size here, then we have a whole lot of grains to get the same optical depth, which is to say when the cross-sectional area is smaller per particle, then to have the same optical depth, we need a higher column density of particles. And then as I expand the particle radius from 1 to 3 to 5 to 7, you'll see that the column density is going down as the, as the cross-sectional area goes up quadratically with radius. So all of these images have the same optical depth, which is 0 0.1, but you can see how the column density and cross-sectional area play together to achieve that optical depth. Now the other plot I wanted to bring up was just what does optical depth look like as we transition from optically thin to optically thick. So here's again the picture of the Mona Lisa and this time I've gone to infinitesimally small grain sizes and stepped through optical depths of zero which is the original picture to 0.1, which corresponded to the images I just showed you with larger particles, 0.5, and 1. Now this is typically the threshold below which we call things optically thin, and above which we call things optically thick, and then as we step from to 1.5, to 2, to 3, you can kind of see that the, the highest optical depth at which your eye can even reasonably discern the picture is optical depth of 3. Uh, and at optical depth of 4, the picture is essentially invisible. So up here we're in the regime of optically thick, down here we're in the regime of optically thin. And if you can get a feel for it, this is what an optical depth of unity looks like. So to summarize, optical depth is a useful concept for understanding how intensity varies as it passes through a medium. We talked about the optically thick and optically thin limits of these equations, where optically thick corresponds to a case where you've essentially lost information about the background radiation and in the optically thin case you're just seeing a linear perturbation on the background radiation by a source function. We introduce a concept for understanding optical depth as a factorization of number density multiplied by cross-section times the area through your medium which you could then call a column density of your medium multiplying the number density and the distance and that column density multiplies cross-sectional area to give you your optical depth. There are other factorizations of optical depth that may be appropriate in other applications.